Finney, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm working for NRCS here in Jefferson, Harrison County, and cover some other counties as well. And I'm going to be speaking to you here in just a second, but I, I wanted to put together a panel for tonight to discuss the reasons why we continue to use management and density grazing, why we continue to utilize management and density grazing. To go along with Kevin's goals presentation, um, thank you, Kevin, for doing that excellent job. Um, I just thought it was good to put in perspective what keeps us going out there. Why do we keep going out and doing what we do? Why should we strive to do better? Especially with this group, that's the, the focus here. Um, I forgot to advertise that, that along with our partners here, Jefferson Harrison, Carroll, Extension, Salt and Water, NRCS, we're putting on a passion for profit school coming up here pretty soon. And, and Kevin and I are going to be doing the same presentations for that group but they're going to be a more beginner-focused group, um, so it will change the focus just a little bit. But we wanted to get kind of your ideas, too, as well tonight for why you continue to go out there. And I don't want to put any pressure on my panelists, but we've got a video camera in the back. We're going to video that part. We'll show it at the Passions for Profit School as well, so they can hear from some of our experienced grazers from here from Eastern Ohio Grazing Council. So without any further ado, I'm going to call up some panelists, let them talk to you about why they graze or why they continue to use management intensive grazing. I guess I better advance the slide. I'm, and, and I apologize if I misspelled anybody's name. That's the one slide I forgot to check today. So I think I got everybody right, but I'm not quite certain. So first, I want to have Mr. Stuart Courtney come up. Uh, Stuart, his family farm in Stark County, and, and Stuart probably doesn't remember this. But, well, you remember this part. We worked together at Ohio State University ATI at the farm there. I was just a pee on, let's put it that way. I was a student, I guess is the way to put it. But Stuart taught me how to tie high tensile wire. I couldn't tell you how much money that has saved me over the years in learning how to tie and how to do it fast and efficiently in the thousands and thousands of miles of fence that I've built and that I've inspected and I've looked at for other producers. Stuart's the one that pulled out a piece of high tensile wire, tied a knot in it so fast, flipped the end of it off and handed it to me and said, here, take this home. So I, that's still hanging in a barn for us to go back and look at every once in a while. I still can't do as good as he can, but uh, that's one thing I appreciate about Stuart. For all these years, he's taught me how to, how to build a high tensile fence, and then we kind of kept up since my ATI days, and, and now he comes to the Grazing Council, and I appreciate his research. So Stuart, come on up here and tell us why we continue to. And Kendall's got a mic there for you. Okay, I, I took some quick notes. Uh, I thought about this, but... So let's hope it comes out good. Uh, why I graze? I actually enjoy it. I mean, so we're just going to leave it at that. Uh, when it's done properly, I think it's good for the environment, uh, the ecosystems in the environment, and the wildlife. Um, nature likes diversity. And when I see that a lot of my pastures over the years, they wound up being one grass and one legume and I'm trying to get diversity with different grasses, different forbs and different legumes and pastures. Uh, I unrolled a couple bales of hay today and one of the things that I did see in that bale of hay was buckhorn plantain that had went to seed and you know I, I can remember some people in the past you know oh that's nothing grows out there but buckhorn but you know that's supposed to be a superfood for cattle to consume as far as the leaf and uh, the, the vitamins and minerals in, in, in that plant. So, you know, it was in that hay, I'm gonna see some more of that there. I'm not saying you want a whole pasture of buckhorns, but, or the, the other plantains, um, but you know what, it's another leaf out there catching sunlight in your pastures. So just, you don't want to just a pure stand of grass, a pure stand of legumes, you need a mixture of everything. So, um, and then going back to um, the, the ecosystem and stuff. I remember the first time we had a pasture walk at the farm, Clint seen this low spot. And he's like, you know what? You got to be careful there. You're gonna, you're gonna, if you go on that when it's wet, you're gonna damage it. And I didn't damage that area, but there's another area that when the creek floods, it, it gets trapped with water and. Um, I've always had a hard time with that, that just sealed itself off and the water not going away. And um, 
last year, well, years ago, I, I was able to plant tillage radishes and stuff like that in there. And last year, two years ago now, I got sunflowers in there. And then this last year, I got sunflowers again, pearl millet, and some buckwheat. And it was just amazing to see how many um, goldfinches that we had when those sunflowers went to seed. I mean, there was how many hundreds of goldfinches that you drive around that patch of sunflower and you know but I'm not going to water there right now so I think I've made an improvement there so um, and as far as the, the coin phrases for rotational MIG regenerative and adaptive grazing um, I'm not 100% sure I still use the, the big style of grazing I think I've moved to maybe hopefully toward the regenerative, maybe even to the adaptive. And, you know, I've watched a lot of stuff from like Dr. Alan, Alan Williams and stuff like that. And sometimes you got to be a little rough on your soil, I think, a little bit to incorporate, you know, the uh, organic matter and stuff like that, unrolling the hay on the pastures. Um, I, I unrolled hay for years on top of knolls that would in the summertime at home, sand and gravel that would just turn brown when the uh, uh, through the heat of the summer. But by putting that hay on top of those hills and, and rolling that hay down the hills, this summer I've noticed that it didn't turn brown when we started to dry up at home. So, you know, I, I think that kind of stuff makes a difference. So, um, things that have changed me over time. Uh, I got a 17 year old son, and now all he wants to do is spend all of his time in the tractor. And when I was 17 years old, I wanted to spend my time in the tractor too. And now I don't want to spend that time in the tractor. And he doesn't know this, but the reason I won't fix the air conditioners in the tractors <laughs> is because I don't want people on a hot summer day to spend all day sitting in the tractor thinking we got a brush hole because the cows could be trampling that grass on the ground for us if we don't have to sit in there and burn up diesel fuel to we'll do it. Now he sees this tape, he's going to uh, Hopefully he won't see it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, you know, and, and we talked about, you know, uh, Kevin talked about you, you, you can't. The measuring part. Oh, we can't manage what you don't measure. Can't manage what you don't measure. I don't use my plate meter as much as I used to. Now, this last summer, I spent a lot of time with just a soil thermometer. And I would measure in dense swords of grass, you know, and see, hey, I got 78 degrees right here. In places where I tall grass graze and lay down on the ground, I still had 78 degrees. But if there's places where a cow overgrazes, that, that soil temperature will go up over 100 degrees in a hurry. So, you know, by, by letting some of that stuff mature, tall grass grazing, letting it go to seed, you're laying that uh, carbon down on the ground and you're protecting that soil from the sunlight, I think. But, um, but uh, and going into that, I, I, I allowed more rest for my pastures. Um, and I allowed some of that seed to mature. So you're also allowing stuff to mature that sometimes you don't want to mature as far as weeds and stuff like that. But, you know, I heard something uh, go on about a story about, you know, the best, uh, the, you know, the bull. How far you had to go to get the bull, you know, it's the bull story. And a lot of times the best bull on your farm is one that grew up on your farm. And so maybe some of these grasses that are on your farm are adapted to your farm by allowing them even to go to seed and reproduce and, and you know reseeding your own pastures. So and I some of my pastures I do like to make hay off of that's mature and unroll those on other areas of the farm. So um, another note I have on here is you know trying to mimic nature. And when I when I first started doing this, I man, I, I calved in February and March, and it was it was horrible. And you know, you had cold, chilled calves, and you know, now we we calve in uh, in April, you know, and into May. And the biggest challenge we have if we make a long move with the cattle 
is to make sure you have all the babies with you when you move. So, uh, what the cabin sees, and I like to do just a next door move. So, and you know, it, it's like you're managing a small herd of bison that between you and your electric fence is the predator that keeps them together tight on your farm. Um, me being the predator that chooses who gets to stay and the electric fence being the predator who gets to keep them where I want them. So, um, I, you know, I have some notes on here about frost seeding and, you know, every year I spend a considerable amount of money on clover seed and I think that's good, but I also can see the benefit of allowing some of these clovers to have a longer rest in the summertime and reseed themselves. So, but um, I think that's all I have. So, thank you. Thanks, sir. All right, next, why don't you probably have one come up? I'm going through those mics, I think. And when I came to Harrison County, I was tasked with, okay, my, my old boss told me, Tom Perry, he said, I've developed all the easy springs, now you got to develop all the hard ones. And we've done a good job of that, but now we got to implement rotational grazing or management intensive grazing as we go. And I said, well, how many are there? And he said, not many. And we went out for a ride, out the Earsville Ridge, we made a turn, and I come to a farm, and I said, well, that one there grazes. I said, who's that? And he says, Blair Hubbard. So <laughs> I'm interested to hear Blair's thoughts. He's one of the longest term grazers that we have in Harrison County. So. I tried that. I tried that. In the, it was in the mid 70s, tried grazing lambs. And uh, I didn't have the equipment to graze lambs. And uh, they kind of they moved themselves all over the place <laughs> several times. That was kind of a failure. It was, it was me, I didn't know what I was doing, and, and they didn't have equipment that would, would to hold a lamb. Didn't have the right any chargers or the kind of fence that we do now, but uh, so the king gave up on that one and the lambs didn't work out too good for him, but we uh, ran a grass-based dairy for several years. Uh, first as a seasonal dairy on grass, and then uh, went to full time uh, for several reasons, but uh, <laughs> it was really nice for the week before Christmas to uh, dry off all the cows and not have to know cows twice a day. But, <laughs> but uh, there were other uh, thing. One thing, the uh, uh, the people who bought our milk didn't like seasonal grazers because we were giving them milk when they had a flush of milk because everybody had grass. So we went full time, and, uh, but we still grazed. We, we've grazed ever since, and uh, we're no longer milk cows. We graze beef cows now, but uh, we still graze. Uh, when we milk cows, we uh, we did a twice a day move because we needed. We had to have been milking twice a day anyway. So when they went back out, they got new grass. Now we, we utilize a uh, about a two to three day move on our cows. Uh, and some places, some places a little more fence. We have water. We have some water issues, so we have to. It controls what we do. But uh, we had about 300 miles of water line when we milk cows that we couldn't let the water control us in. <laughs> we had to have we had to have milk, so we had to have water. Uh, but the reason we do it, I, I enjoy it. It's it's good for our, our land, and uh, like this fall, I, I've got some heavy sod that I I frost seed a lot of ground, but some of it I didn't because the sod was so heavy it wasn't any use. But this fall in December, when we were grazing, it started to rain. So I switched those cows over to that heavy sod and let them tramp it up pretty good. And uh, so I'm going to frost seed that in the spring because they, they worked it up pretty good. I mean, they didn't make mud out of it, but I walk out across there now and you can see their hoof prints. So I got a place for the, for the clover to go. Uh, but it's, it's an, uh, like Stuart said, it's environmentally. You, it's just enjoyable to go out and the, the wildlife, it helps the wildlife and uh, it gets me when you're, uh, you're moving cows every couple of days, you're, 
I go out every day and check fences and check the cows. So I get to spend more time with the cow. So if there's, if there's something going on with a cow, I notice it right away. Uh, and they're, uh, they get used to me walking through them, even the baby calves. You know, I can walk by a baby calf and it doesn't jump up and run. It just lays there because its mother's laying there. So we have tame cows. Maybe too tame sometimes, but we have tame cows. And it's just from daily contact. That's what it is. And uh, I enjoy the cows. I always like cows. And uh, so it makes me happy too. So if it makes me happy, it's part of, part of it's being happy with what you do. So uh, I enjoy getting up in the morning, going out and walking out and checking the grass and see what it looks like and checking the cows. And uh, it's just. Uh, it's, a, it's a, just a wonderful way of life. It, it really is. Uh, because they spend time with them. Uh, and they're used to me. Of course, when we feed a little different when we do feed, uh, I spent the first bale of hay on the 18th of uh, December this year. And uh, I did feed one every day until a little later. But uh, we, uh, we, have, we have the dairy operation there, so our cows are and their own concrete. So I don't, have to, I don't play in the mud much, but, uh, <laughs> which is a good thing. But that's just because we have the facility there from the dairy. Uh, and I have to spread some manure in the spring, but it helps too. That, uh, it's nothing like manure on grass, I'll tell you. It makes grass grow. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, well, when we had the dairy, we had a bed and pack compost manure barn, and that's what we, where the cows are now. They're on a bed and pack. So, uh, like right now, bedding's a little bit of an issue right now with the snow and the, and the water, but we need to go back out on the, on the fields too. So uh, we don't use we don't we don't use any uh, fertilizer at all. This lime, we buy lime. We, other than the, than the cow manure is all we use, uh, and our fields are. This year we had more grass we knew what to do with. Uh, I didn't make, I only made five acres a second <coughs> cutting hay, but I didn't need that. Uh, and I always, I tell, I'll tell anybody, I never made any money making hay. Uh, it's just, a, it's a, costs a lot of money to make hay. That's, a matter of fact, I saw a thing the other day, a 60, what was it, a $60,000 baler Round bales good for 15,000 bales, so every bale you make out of that $60,000 baler, you put $5 in the cost of that, just for the bale. Not going to count the tractor or anything else. <laughs> it's $5 that bale of hay. So when we, uh, when we milk cows, we didn't make any hay. We bought it all. We bought it all out of the West uh, because we couldn't make the hay that we needed. We couldn't make that kind of hay in a mile. <laughs> And so we raised it all. Uh, we got a lot of cows. We had a couple hundred head of cows. But, uh, we bought all our hay. We, we raised corn for corn silage, and uh, we bought all our grain and hay because it was just cost effective. Of course, today you can't ship. We were shipping hay out of South Dakota for a dollar, a dollar a mile. But you're not going to do that now. <laughs> but. Uh, but as far as grazing, uh, I, I don't I, I don't run tractors all day long. I don't I don't care if I run tractors at all. But we have to a little bit. When we make a little hay. We have some property we can graze uh, that we make hay on. But uh, like I said, never made any money making hay, so uh, try not to. But the, the grazing part is just it's just enjoyable for me. It's just like I said, I spend time out in the, in the wild. I can hear the birds sing. The tractor, the own tractor, I can't hear the birds sing. And uh, in fact, I scare them away. So uh, it's just enjoyable. We go out and walk with, walk with the cows and move the fence. And the cows, it, they know when I'm coming. They know when they, you're going to move the fence because as soon as you start taking one down, they're standing there waiting on you. So they have it all figured out too. So. Uh, but that's why I do it. I just enjoy doing it, and it's a good way of life, and uh, I don't spend any more money than I have to doing it. It's a good way to do it.
And uh, it's kind of fun to figure out how you're going to move them, when you're going to move them, and how to uh, use it all. We use, we have it, we have uh, perimeter fences, and then we use all poly wire. And it doesn't take, it really doesn't take long to mine, mine one up and put up another one. Especially if you've got a couple of people going. So by carrying the post and using the wire, it, it, it takes a few minutes. You put up a, you know, you put up a lot of wire. So that's what we do, and then that's why we do it. Sir. Next we'll have Bruce Riddle to come up. And most of you know Ben and Bruce are my neighbors just off the ridge. They probably don't know from the top of the hill of my place, I can see their place. I doubt they can see me, but I can see them. <laughs> but also Ben and Bruce were you know, in a farm bureau council with my parents growing up. I was really, really, really great friends with their boys growing up. I kind of cut my teeth on grazing on their operation. The first exposure I ever had to management intensive grazing was at their place. Probably the most experienced grazers we have in the room. So interested to hear their thoughts. Mm. No, okay, we can do it with one. As you probably know, if you get one of us, you get two. Because we're a team. We uh, move cattle, work cattle, all together. And uh, the main reason we do the grazing my father-in-law, in the 1940s, bought his farm as an overgrown sheep farm, or overrun. So I had, my father-in-law had three pastures, but he had several hay fields that he would pasture after he took first or second cutting hay. His cattle always looked good and did well at the fall feeder calf sales. It showed us what could be done. He restored an overgrazed sheep farm back to a productive dairy. He was a demonstration farm for Jefferson Harrison County. Strong advocate for soil health, even before it was a buzzword. So, we got our farm back from being stripped for coal. We had nothing. It's whatever the coal company spread out there. So we learned from his example what we could do once we got cattle back how to cut the paddocks down. I mean, we ran a tractor over every inch of that farm making hay before we were allowed to do pasture. So we know where we don't want to be. The cattle can get where we can. And also, we've done this long enough, it's almost second nature to us. We don't think in the spring, where are we going to start? You look at the grass and we start from there. We have exterior fences around the whole thing that are high tensile electrified, then we go in and subdivide. Usually if we put a fence in 10 years in a row, then we'll put a high tensile through there. We figure after 10 years it's probably going to be there for forever. Um, and it's, it's interesting every year between the weather, the animal units, projects we have, our health, and economics, what we're going to do. There's no book out there that says on December 1 you can do this. Because you don't know what every year December 1 is going to look like. We have better handle on the condition of our cattle. Like Blair said, we see them every two to three days. We know if something's limping, we can write it down. We know if the calf is lethargic. We know if we're missing calves. We fall calves, so the time we're, when we're grazing, it's in the fall with calves. And they hide them in places where you wouldn't believe. And we started fall grazing. We started fall grazing when both of us were working, because Bruce worked shift work and I worked nine to five. So I get home at six and in February, and he's at work, and I'm down there struggling with a calf or something. It was not fun. So we started fall grazing then, and we fall graze in September, and fall calf in September, and we're fortunate enough in that we have an old bank farm. We bring our cows up to the feedlot usually around January, February, because uh, we run out of grass then. And the calves have the old bank farm to go in. The cows are on the feedlot eating. They come out, they eat when they're ready. They go back to the barn when they're ready. Uh, 
a lot of times the moms aren't happy, they're down there bawling, saying, come out here, get this milk. And then when we get ready to wean, all we have to do is shut the gate between the two barns. Uh, it works for us, but we have the good fortune of having an extra barn for the calves when it's really, really bad. We subdivide our paddocks, like I said. We even subdivide this time of year. I've got a group of heifers out right now. And we find if you don't subdivide, they're going to run that whole place, and they're going to pick the good stuff. Then they're going to go back through, and they're going to get the not real good stuff, mediocre. Third time through, they're going to get the rank stuff. And you can just watch their conditions drop. By Making them eat everything uniform, they're getting the full, the full paddock, and then we move them to the next one. Of course, they're going to the lush grass first, but there isn't as much of it. So they eat the mediocre and the rank at the same time. They, they do not drop body conditions for us. And as we improve our pastures, we're finding we use less stored feed. We bale hay on about 30 acres of a farm, maybe buy a little bit, but uh, used to be late October, early November, we were feeding hay. This year we fed our first bale on January 14th. And like I say, I've got a group of heifers that are still out on pasture. Again, they're lighter, and the area they're in is very, very vegetative. This is only the second time they've seen it this year. So there's a lot of dead grass there that they can trample down and not hurt the uh, ground at all. And I'm going to set that up there. <laughs> Kevin talked about a map. We have a map of the entire farm. When we did our uh, nor nu man nutrient management plan, this was a map that was drawn up. It's got our soil types on it, acreage, it has spreadable acreage and it has the holdout areas on it. We have 24 paddocks and we have water in each one of the paddocks. We're not done, we still have other places we'd like to put water. But we can, with them, that many paddocks, we're able to pull them out at different times of the year. This year we had a, a major pond renovation project and also we did a spring development redid our main water storage area. We're able to take those cattle for months away from the barn, away from the, that part of the farm. And we have contractors that are on a different schedule than you are, and they like to run everywhere. So you can't guarantee they're not going to leave that gate open. So if the cattle aren't even close to them, it works very, very well. And also with this map, everything's Number when you're moving cattle, you can put down when you move them out of a certain paddock. When we subdivide the paddocks, we just use a letter after the number, and we have it after this many years. We have it pretty well down where they're gonna, where the letters are going to be. And like it's pretty well preempted. I've been said before. It's nice to walk out there, see the cattle. You're mostly going to green grass. We have days that aren't as nice as others, but we always have have that in the back of your mind that one of these days it's going to get better. And I'm going to read a quick article here. This is from Matt Poor. He's a nutrition specialist from North Carolina State University. We've heard him on several West Virginia tours. I believe he has his own cattle. They said there's not a single recipe. The foundation point is there is no exact way you need to do grazing management to be successful. Don't think someone can come to your farm and tell you in a short time how to implement your grazing system. The key to your development will be use and reiteration process of trying new practices and modifying them to fit your system. Not all grazing practices will work on every farm, but you should be trying new things and evaluating them. Don't be stuck in a specific system, as it will limit your ability to react to such things as changing markets, 
rainfall, too much or not enough, animal health, that may occur along the way. As you develop your strategic grazing skills, attend grazing workshops, and get help from informed advisors. Apply what you learned on your farm and evaluate the outcome. Beware of folks that say they can tell you exactly what you need to be successful. The best manager will never say never and never say always to any practice. They will be open to new ideas, techniques, and they will critically evaluate every action they take so they can adapt practices to reach their long-term goals. <coughs> Very good. Thank you, guys. All right. Last but not least, Mr. John McCarr. John is another one of those legacy operations that I got to see when I first came to the area or came back to the area. And then, of course, as a nephew of Mr. Earl McCarr, to Kevin alluded to, and so he got to learn from one of the best. So I'm interested to hear his thoughts. I want you to bring him home, John. What's that? I said I wanted you to bring him home. <laughs> okay, Kevin asked me, or Clint asked me, why I continue rotational grades. Uh, the first question that came to my mind when he asked me that, uh, the thought that goes through my head every day, every week, every year is different. So why do we expect to do the same thing as we did the previous year? You can't. You got to be flexible. Every you got to work with Mother Nature. That's number one. You got to get that. It ain't shop work. It ain't piece work. You got to work with Mother Nature. Uh, I got manure dis dispersion. Uh, one of the reasons I rotational graze. Uh, if you got the cows in one paddock for an extended period of time, they won't develop a pattern. And when you develop a pattern, you're going to get them passed throughout the fields. They're going to take the shortest route from point A to point B. You start getting passed. They're going to start laying down in one particular place, and you're not getting very good manure dispersion. Uh, with that manure, disbursement, you're going to get more tons per acre because rather than putting all that manure under one tree or in a particular area, it's getting spread throughout where it came off of. Uh, I actually have green grass, eatable grass, that grows underneath my trees, just from rotational grazing management. Uh, cows ain't spending an extended period of time under there. Uh, soil compaction is another big one in my book. Uh, the soil is able to heal itself. Just picture the soil as your thumb when you're driving a nail in. You smack your thumb. The first time you smack that, it's going to hurt. But it will heal itself. If you smack that two more times, you're probably going to have to get some medical assistance to heal that up. <laughs> the soil is the same way. It ain't the first footprint, as Uncle Earl says. It's not the first footprint that does the damage. It's the ones after that. Um, so that, that, with the rotational grazing, you're going from paddock and there's cattle going on that paddock for a short few days or less, and then that soil gets the break. It can rejuvenate itself. It can breathe again. It's not cons consistently getting stampled on. Uh, less inputs. Uh, you got uh, rotational grazing. You can you can manage your species that you grow out there. 
you've got Alsac clover, you've got red clover, you've got orchard grass, you've got blue grass, you've got all them grasses out there. If you leave them cows out there continuous, they are going to pick the most tender plant that they can find. And the more less desirable ones, just like Bruce was talking, the less desirable ones are going to get left. And those more desirable ones are going to continue to get nip, 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 nip until they got such a shallow root system that they can no longer compete against the less desirable plants. So with that, it turns into more tons per acre. Because you've got more species, you've got more legumes, so legumes put nitrogen in the ground to feed your grasses. So if you manage that all right, you can grow multiple species and manage your grasses right. That, that, uh, I'm kind of jumping around here and I'm getting lost on my notes. But uh, now I lost my whole train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> With the different varieties of grasses, you can manage them, and, and I know where it's going now. Uh, you think of a grass, it, it, its whole purpose in the whole life cycle of a grass is to germinate, grow, produce a seed, and die. If you can keep that grass in a grass stage and keep away from that hollow stem coming up through, that grass is in its prime stage. And as long as you keep that grass in its prime stage, that's where it's going to be most productive. And you're going to, that's also going to put the most back into your soil as far as keeping your soil biology working. Uh, another thing about rotational grazing, uh, animal handling. You're out there moving them cows. They're used to you. They know the sound of the four-wheeler. They know the sound of the side-by-side. -side. They hear that thing coming. They follow me because they know they're going to get something better than what they're leaving from. So I ain't out there chasing. Well, Kevin caught me years ago saying, call my cows some names you don't know want to call them. <laughs> <laughs> Until I got things figured out how to work these things. You got, once them cows know you and you know your cows, it, it's no, it, it ain't a hard job to move them. And then if you got an animal or something out there that's got pink eye, foot rot or something, you can do something with them. You're not out there spending, running around, running them through fences and trying to force them to go someplace that they don't want to go so you can get the group into the barn. Uh, another big thing I like is it gets, forces you out there in the pasture. I got a lot of stuff going. I roughly farm 450 acres or something. I do custom round bailing. I've gotten back into square bailing. Hey, and uh, I get pretty busy sometimes throughout the year. And you try to talk yourself out of the hole, they'll be all right till tomorrow. They'll be all right till tomorrow. Well, if they was in a big paddock and I wasn't forced to be out there, well, I could see myself pretty easily. They'll be all right till tomorrow. Tomorrow comes, tomorrow never gets here. Next thing you know, you got grass that looks like the neighbors. That's about that tall, year round. Uh, uh, I guess I've covered. Uh, profitability. You get more tons per acre because you can manage that grass because you, you're in control of when those cows go in, when they come out. Uh, you got less input cost. Uh, I can use an example there last spring. Turned out early, I'm like Clint, I like to get them out there April, third week in April, I like to be out. Well, we got a lot of weather, a lot of 
wet soil at that time still, but if you don't get them out there, then the grass has a tendency to get ahead of them. Well, I turned the one group out in a paddock, and no more than I turned them out, it went off the rain. And they just, oh, you couldn't see three blades of grass in that old paddock. I just ruined that. But I waited until it dried, and I went in there and lightly smoothed it up because I'm serious. There was no blades of grass to be seen. And never seeded, never nothing. But unto behold, that pasture rejuvenated. With a little bit of management, turn the cows in, the mow the grief, eat the wheat off when they're short and tender before they get to the bitter stage. And to this day, you would never know that paddock looked like it, it does now. Just through management and being able to flash graze that when the weeds got up to six inches high for a half a day or three quarter of a day. And, and get them pulled back out to let that new sprouts of grass come up. But yet to get the weeds mowed down so they weren't taking out the grass. Uh, I don't mow my pastures no more. Uh, one year there I spent, I kept track of my hours on the brush hole, clipping pastures. A hundred hours. <coughs> out there on the tractor with the 15 foot brush off. And now I said, this is ridiculous. So now I put the spot sprayer on the ATV, and when I like to, and I use a 2,4-D product just for my broad leaves, and when I like to do is when I move a group of cows, Go right back to that pasture they came from. When the grass is short, the weeds are sticking up to where you can see them, the thistles, the dock weeds, the mall floor rows, whatever it might be there, and run around, take 15 minutes, run around and squirt down weeds. And and as far as clipping pastures, that, that's always been a big discussion. Clip or not clip. Well, I'm a hard believer in not clipping. You come in the spring of the year, you got that lush grass, it starts turning drier, and then when the second grass comes up, the regrowth starts back, you got all that lush grass, them animals are just starving for some fiber. It's there if they want it from that tall grass. And after about the third, fourth time through, there's, there's no dead grass left to be seen. It's either been trampled, eaten, or whatever. Uh, then the other thing is that dead grass, it does reseed, go back to seed. Then the other thing, uh, you look at soil erosion, that grass bends over, it lays flat on the ground. When that raindrop comes down, it's hitting that plant laying on the ground. It's breaking the impact of that raindrop from hitting that soil. Because where you get your soil erosion, not only from runoff, but when that raindrop hits that bare soil, that soil is getting thrown up in the air. And that's moving. It's taking, and it leaves it for erosion. So that's, that's the reason I don't like the clip. Uh, I don't see no reason to clip. Uh, the other thing I don't do is I don't add no additional nutrients outside of what the cows put back on and line. I keep the pastures lined up and whatever the cows put back on because you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but a cow will utilize 20% of what she eats and put 80% back on the soil. Is that correct? Or, or more. Or more. Okay. Or more back. Yeah, so right there close. So she ain't, it takes a long time for that cow to pull nutrients out of the ground. Uh, 
So to answer the second half of Clint's question, what keeps me from opening the gate up and just letting them graze the whole farm? All the reasons of this gate. It's, uh, yeah, unless I missed one. And there's lots of them I missed because there's an endless list of reasons the rotation of grave. Uh, endless list of reasons not to continue his graves. Uh, yeah, my neighbor, he, he, I walk out my door every morning. And right there is the pasture. Cows are in there 365 days a year. He only brush hogs it to maintain the thistles and the dock weeds and the mold floor roof. There is no grass there to clip them up. No. It, it just, the grass never gets above two inches. And, and, and you think about that, the, and, and another story I got to tell you, a uh, neighbor down the road, uh, husband passed away there last February, and well, I got the honors to help her take care of her cows. And they pretty much graze year round on the same path. Well, I've noticed hauling hay out in the pasture field because there's, there's, there again, it is clipped down short. On these muddy days, who can guess how deep the ruts are that I'm cutting in that pasture? <laughs> Somebody guess. No. But that soil is so compacted. It's got no life, it's got no microorganisms, it's got no root mass, it, it, it exists, that's it. I am not cutting, I'm barely even leaving a tread. But you got out of my pastures, you're going to slide down the hill, you're going to spin around, you're going to, you're going to make a mess. But yeah, that's, that's the difference. I got life in my soil. I got biology working. I got any place you can go. Uh, earthworms. I mean, you want to see the soil structure of ground? Just dig a shovel full up and see how many earthworms you get. That'll tell you an awful lot right there. So, uh, anybody got any questions for me? Clint, you got any closing comments or anything? I'll close it out some. Thank you very much, John. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, where the Kendall's right there. <laughs> As you all know, Kendall's the president. I'm the vice president of the Eastern Grazing Council. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, don't forget to thank our sponsors up there and support them. And uh, uh, Next month meetings at Carrollton, right? Yes. Work, uh, what's the location? The new Carrollton Extension Office. Which is on High Street, right? Okay. Be right across from Carroll Salon Water, right in that general facility. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. I want to thank all of our panelists. That was excellent. Thank you guys. Um, makes my job easy. I I actually put some let's get my work there. I put some thoughts together, but I don't need to talk about them because they hit them all. They covered every part of what I was going to talk about. I've kind of compartmentalized it down to I oh mean I really advanced the slide once tonight. In the economics, we talked, everybody said a little bit of something about economics. Is there a delay on that thing to do it, or am I just not good at it? Environmental. Everybody had an environmental reason why they continue to grade. Lots of questions at the main time. Reasons for the livestock. Almost all of them had a reason for the livestock. I can't really add to you anything that they had to say, because everything they said was true and everything matters to why they continue to manage grades. And a lot of them had emotional reasons. I like 
I like to go out there and work with the livestock. I like the livestock being easy to be able to move. Those are all good reasons for why we need to do what we do. So if you haven't figured out, it's kind of my theme for the year. I like to ask people, why do you continue to do it? And I started this a couple years ago. Um, I actually asked Cliff Miller years ago, why do you continue to do this, Cliff? Why are you so into this? And Cliff was an analytical thinker. I mean, heavy thinker. Chemical engineer had, a, had a, a scientific answer for most every question I asked him. And he said, because I get to see my farm. I, I knew why, but I asked him. I said, what do you mean? He says, I get to see my farm. If I had to buy my farm today, it would, be, it would cost me $6,000 an acre. He said, there's rotation of grazing. In the spring, I see it every 15 days. In the summer, I see it every 30 days. In the fall, I see it every 60 days. And over the 150 days that most people feed hay, I'm grazing cows and I get to see my farm. In every season, in every weather, I get to enjoy it. That $6,000 don't seem like much when you get to see it all the time. When I was making hay, I only got to see it three times a year. I get to see it many, many, many times a year in all weather and all seasons. That's a very good point, I thought. <clears throat> Push the button one too many times, I guess. So, for everything we had that we talked about and presented, I mean, we realize that we're talking to a group of you, a lot of you are experienced grazers, you've been doing this a long time, but what my intent and Kevin's intent tonight was maybe to take you that one step further. Maybe if you heard reasons from your fellow producers of why they continue to graze, maybe that takes, so everything that we talked about is true also. If we take that one step further, we see that one more benefit, that one more thing that might improve our operation. And one more example. And I want to bring this to you too because you all are our cheerleaders. Our agency work is so much easier because we've got you out there doing it. You've got, you're out there selling conservation for us. We can go out to the pocket producer and if they know one of you, we can kind of work off of that and say, you know, like they do, like, like how they do. And if you're continually improving, that sure helps our job out to be able to help someone else look at how they're going to improve. When I go out and I tell a producer we're going to talk about rotational grazing, I start with, I want you to move once a day. I start with, I want you to move every seven days. But then they see one of your operations where you go a little bit further and they take that one step further. So, hopefully, we maybe energize you a little bit to go out there and get started this spring to find the problems, to figure out how grazing management can help you to fix those problems. I mean, we've all got a ton of them right now. And, and we talked a lot about extending the grazing season here, and I love it because that is the one thing that we can help to alleviate some of the problems we've got going on right now. All of us have in one place or another. So with that, I want to thank the crew that helped put all this together, Stuart and Harrison Small the Water staff, and Kevin for coming up, and, and our panelists for being here. This all works because we all work together and, and make this work. Um, we, we do appreciate it. Just so glad to be back together. Um, I missed the meeting in October, and then I miss y'all November and December. It's great to have my grazing support group back together and get together and talk and, and enjoy each other's company. So with that, um, don't feel like you got to run out of here. You can network as much as you want to, but have a safe trip home, unless Kendall has something else to say. Kendall's shaking his head numb. So <laughs> thank you all for coming.